All right. So again, thanks everyone for taking some time of the Sunday uh, weekend uh, kind of leisure time and uh, jumping on here to discuss stuff. Uh, we did have some major progress in terms of understanding what we actually have to create thanks to the that same conversation that we had together and basically the video recording of that uh, propagated throughout the slack channel and from every direction we we had a lot of feedback and a lot of ideas uh, i've actually connected with uh, dr tayeb who's leading 100 medical professionals on kaggle to kind of actually uh, write meaningful literature review um, pieces, which I've sent you um, via the the link called Corona Med link. And just to give you an example uh, or overview of what this is, this is basically uh, we help Dr. Tayeb and all of these medical professionals to put an interface to these tables. So you can search by different things like um, like uh, specific questions and you can see literature reviews that are done um, in a crowdsourced manner. So basically people are actually doing these manually and there are all kinds of things and I have no idea what all of these columns mean, but uh, I'm assuming they're, they're useful. So that's, that's basically an update from our side of things. Uh, we're still figuring out the um, the scope of work for the problem of uh, classifying, categorizing papers into types of papers, which seems to be a very confusing task in a way, uh, because many people think differently in, in terms of what are the categories, and everyone has it in their own mind, but it's very hard for them to put it on, on paper. And that spreadsheet, which uh, Ola re uh, edited, was kind of uh, a crowdsourced uh, effort to, to bring some structure. And I really liked the, the additions that Ola did to simplify that, that structure too. That's, that's pretty, much, pretty much it. And I'll stop talking and let you guys jump in. Well, what do you want to hear from us? <laughs> That's a good. I, I guess my question is: Did everybody have a chance to look at the like most updated spreadsheet, the types of papers? It just kind of combines what other people put there. Does it make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any other additions or modifications? Do we maybe screen share it? Let's see. Let me share that real quick. Yeah. Okay. So essentially the. The piece that Ola added, um, let me highlight that in green here, um, was a, a simplification of different things and basically going more high level versus uh, going deeper into epidemiology or mm -hmm. specific like clinical trial stuff. And there are some things that she added as additional uh, things. So for, for example, for molecular studies, some of the things like model system and study type and, uh, and other things. So the question is, do you guys have any feedback on, on this? Like, do you think that's a complete simplification of the overall categorization? Because obviously it, it's not gonna be 100% correct and everyone will have their opinions, but at least this will give us the 80% uh, you know, accuracy. I think this better represents my personal like understanding of the literature because the the first list did seem very like very epidemiological which is helpful for epidemiologists <laughs> but this is broader i think yeah i agree i like i like that second sort of classification i do think you can have kind of subcategories eventually you know you can see if you can get it to categorize objects articles broadly and then after that you can work and see if it can assign subcategories and pull more data like you know for a clinical trial maybe it could pull like several things you know one bit of data it could pull out is whether it's randomized another could be the sample size etc uh, do you want to add like some of those things because there are some subcategories here 
in the column next to the green column that would be like subcategories, but you know, like feel free to add these other subcategories that you think would be useful. Actually, now that I think about it, it might make sense rather than have subcategories to say, you know, for each of these categories of article, these are the kinds of basic data and information we want to extract um, that would be relevant for this category. So for molecular studies, you know, you'd have the, so you could have a list where it would say model organism, colon, mouse, right? Et cetera, et cetera. For clinical trials, it would say randomized, yes, sample size, blah, uh, phase one, et cetera. I'm also, that make, um, sorry, Alex. Does that make sense? I, mm -hmm. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, that makes uh, a lot of sense. What is, uh, word so these two I understand already uh, because someone added this, I think Kara uh, did. What is cell lines or what is the, where does it fit? Cell lines can be in the model. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, like human cells, a human cell culture is a type. And then, uh, the, you know, for the model, it could say like model system, human cell culture, and then it could list the st strain of cells or something like that. They're all different names for that. Okay. So I, I actually really like the way that you, Alex, ex explained it. Like, what is the absolute necessary, um, you know, things that should exist in that study or like in, in those types of right. studies? That would be conserved among, that it should be able to extract uh, for all, papers that fit into this category. Okay, and uh, do we think there are some other uh, things like model, study type, what else for molecular ones? So I'm looking at the Corona Med uh, link that you sent. Uh, and in some of the categories of studies, they also have study type uh, in which they have categorized it. So I'm looking right now at, um, which one? Uh, I don't remember which I clicked on right now. It should say it on the, at the top, right here. So for instance, um, ah. let's see changes in, if you go to changes in uh, COVID-19 as the virus evolves, okay. um, there is a column that study type. Okay. So it seems that for these, they have manually curated some study types. Uh, so it, it could be nice to also go through these or extract all of these study types from, uh, from these lists and, you know, make sure that what we have is comprehensive of all of everything that's included there. Uh, so for instance, like uh, meta-analysis, that's an important subtype, which is a little bit like a review, but a review usually just summarizes uh, findings. A meta-analysis combines all the data to do more analysis. Um, so it'd be good to extract all of the categories from, like, seems like people have already done the work. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Let me put the note here. Um. There's also one thing uh, I was going to mention to you, which is a problem I kind of have with how the data set was assembled, which is, you know, for whether or not a paper was included in the data set was just a binary thing. You know, they did this search for various terms and then either the paper's in or it's not in. Yeah. But it doesn't, I, I haven't seen anything about, you know, trying to, kind of measure or quantify in some way how relevant the paper is to coronavirus. Because, you know, the clinical trials of remdesivir, which are very important, are in the data set. And another thing that's in the data set is like, uh, you know, bovine fecal analysis study from three years ago that mentions coronavirus once in the body of the paper. Yeah. So I wonder if there's a way to kind of also uh, you know, if, if not either quantify, say, how often the relevant 
uh, keywords for coronavirus appear in a paper and or how much attention the paper is getting because there are things like altmetric that collect uh, you know how often papers are tweeted or written about or uh, downloaded. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that we uncovered only after four weeks uh, working with this data set, uh, unfortunately. But um, the the realization came from the fact that uh, we talked to Allen Institute of AI that assembles this data set. And we realized that their their inclusion, their initial filter is quite quite basic, and it produces a lot of noise, and a lot of things are uh, either missed out or some things are completely irrelevant. So, and I'm not sure, like I'm not the person to judge it, but I've seen multiple of these papers which have nothing to do with, um, you know, coronavirus or like for example this one, stock, uh, stock or stroke stock market movement and stock incidents in Taiwan. And obviously like the relevancy of this paper to the actual research um, of virus is, is very low. Um, Arthur, I remember one of the tools you showed us last time did have a score, like a relevant score too, right? So. Yeah, and that was um, less of a tool, but a manual kind of process that assembled many uh... things together. Um, that was the that's the reason why we don't have it as a scalable method right now but it would be amazing to have that because essentially what we have um, is um, let's see we have it somewhere oh, in findings a second Yeah, so like number of keyword occurrences as an example, and then we had a score, um, I think, in this task we had, oh yeah, just the, the score. So I do agree, we should probably introduce, start introducing it uh, somewhere here or, or something, and yeah. What would be the best way for you, Alex, to assess that type of like relevancy metric? Uh, yeah, I think I would use my guess. And, you know, if you want to apply machine learning methods to it, then I have no idea. But if I had to come up with one that I designed, I would use two things. The first is I would, you know, so in the uh, archive paper where they describe the assembly of this data set, they list a bunch of search terms that they search for in the title and body of the paper. So what I would do is I would say, how often do these search terms appear? Do, and especially, you know, bonus points if they appear in the title of the paper and bonus points if the search terms have to deal specifically with this coronavirus, like COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 or the two of their search terms I would weight kind of the most heavily. Perfect. Uh, and so, yeah, for each paper, it's pretty trivial, I'm sure, to get how many times it appears in the title and the body. And I would say title is bo more important. And then the, the title gets a bit of a bonus relative to the body. How exactly to calibrate that, I'd probably do by trial and error. You know, I'd do a bunch of searches and modulate it until I get stuff that seems relevant. Yeah. And then I might, now this is harder to collect. I don't know how easy it is to collect this data, but when you click on all these papers, you could see they have scores. Uh, there's this, yeah, Altmetric is the website I thought of for how, you know, impactful the paper seems to be in the short term, you know, and if you could get Which access website? to it. So I think it's called Altmetric. This is not perfect, and I need to think about this more. Um, yeah, altmetric.com. Uh, oh, wow. This is cool. Yeah, uh, I need to think about this more because what I really wanted was like, download paper downloads and reads per day or month but that doesn't appear to be a universal website that does that for all kinds of papers whereas altmetric i see it on all of the sources pretty much for this data set but if there was a way to collect this data i think that would also be useful to rank the sort of the papers that seem to be most impactful higher than the ones that people are kind of not looking at oh wow they have the api so we can integrate that that's cool. All right. So 
um, let's assume that we can integrate Altmetric and maybe there are other tools that we can uh, use for this purpose. On, on, on the level of you as, as a researcher navigating this, what are the top three things that usually you see on Altmetric that would be useful? Well, just to add in, Altmetric is, it's really like a media popularity score. Um, so as long as, I mean, as long as people know that going in, it's like it, it, you know, quantifies blog posts, news outlets that connect to that story, which is, I think, I think Alexander's totally right. Like that's interesting and useful to have. Um, it's an additional it is, thing. Very specific. Yeah. I'd, I'd rather have, like I said, you know, downloads yeah. of the paper. That's what right, right. usually... For an old paper, I'd look at how often it's cited. For a new paper, I'd look, mm -hmm. and well, a lot of these are, I'd look at how often it's downloaded. But mm -hmm. I thought it looks like the information on that is harder to get out, and, yeah. but it would probably be worth it if we could get it. Altmetric, I think, does have some relevance because a yeah. lot of scientists now have Twitter accounts. So number of tweets might be the best metric in a way because that's actually scientists tweeting it and a lot of the time and not like oh, wow. the journal. Wait, is that a thing? Like you guys use It's totally to a thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't, but most people do. It's yeah, actually it's an amazing. Thing. Yeah, it's an amazing resource because then you do see what scientists are excited about or angry at. I mean, it goes both ways, right? Mm, so, like sentiment score. Does Altmetric do the sentiment score? I don't think it's that smart. I find a random paper. It's really just attention, yeah. right? Which again could be positive or negative. Yeah. But I mean, it's relevant for knowing what's out there, I guess. And um, so I found that the, uh, I need to reach out for the free um, account for St. Metric researchers. I, I assume we fall into that category. I have no idea what that means, but <laughs> I hope that they can give us the, the free um, API access. Um, is there a way, do you guys have an account or can I sign up for one just to explore? Uh. I have no idea how this works. I've never tried to get data off from them. Hmm. Okay, so it seems... What, what is it you have to sign up for? Uh, no, no, the actual, like, how to use it. Oh, the API. For no, it. no, not the API. I, I'll handle the API. I want to see how it looks like for you. How, what? Like I'll, a I'll... demo. Yeah, like the, so for example, I go to, uh, to the side here and essentially what I want to, to see is like an example of those like tweets or like oh 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 okay so actually I can't find it on their website what I find it on is usually like um, any med archive article has an alt metric score so I'll put a link uh, should I guess I should email it because somehow you can't copy links out of zoom chat which is one of the dumbest things I've ever encountered <laughs> but yes. so I'm sending you, I'll, I'll just put in the email chain, a very controversial, annoying article that I don't like, uh, but that has attracted a lot of attention. And so there, I, I've sent it now, and you can see uh, the altmetric page on that article. And it has, uh, I think the number of tweets is probably the most important, because a lot of those might actually be scientists. Perfect. All right. Uh oh, and they actually break down uh, uh, who's looking at who is tweeting it it looks like oh wow Red, I had that I didn't realize but it looks like they have a count of how many like scientists have mentioned it that's amazing oh yeah yeah so the Twitter demographics they actually look at whether it's a scientist tweeting it so you could say like number of tweets by scientists could be a metric you could use when scoring an article. Okay, so the bare minimum that we can do for now is actually include a link to this page for each paper, right? I, yeah, maybe, I don't know. I think like I would be, I guess like I don't go looking for this actively, but I think it might be a good way of telling whether I would want to see a paper. Yeah. Like a, a ranking them. Yeah. And that's the next step, uh, right. assuming we get the, the integration. But for right now, just giving people more more uh, context into this. I mean, the Altimetric is a score. It's like an integrated score of media attention. So like just scraping off the score and reporting it might be enough. Okay, perfect. Or, or like scientist tweets, whichever you find more useful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this is um, amazing. The other thing I was going to mention is um, 
because I, I totally agree that number of downloads would be really important because like mostly it's going to be scientists downloading it. Um, the individual journals do keep track of that. And I don't know if there's like a, a single way to get those data from all the different journals, but as far as I know, every journal page, when you go to a paper, you somehow, at least in some of them, I know you can get the actual number of downloads. Right. I think we all check for our own papers, like how many times. Oh yeah. In, in fact, Google Scholar might actually already integrate that information. Um, so I, I Googled for this and it seems like they offer this for like authors. So mm -hmm. only authors, authors can, can see that. Um, oh, is that true? So Google Scholar, it looks like they only have the number of citations, which isn't that useful. And I've also seen some journals that have number of article downloads, but they don't have number of article downloads like per unit time. So it's hard to tell whether people have been excited about this article recently, which is a little bit difficult. Like, I mean, you could just assume it was uniform, but it might probably yeah. won't be. You know, for an article not very related to coronavirus, it might have had a ton of downloads in like 2005, but not so many recently. Yeah, true. Okay, well, so uh, basically the only solution I see is going back to Allen Institute of AI that already has relationships with all these publishers and basically requesting um, the additional metadata about the amount of, of downloads. Okay, makes sense. Oh, uh, and we actually have Anton here on, on the call who is uh, mm -hmm. helping me with some of the technical things at Corona Y. And he's also uh, kind of leading the Allen Institute of AI um, communication. So it's actually really helpful that, that you're here. Yes. Yeah, so actually, we're like next week, we're launching a dedicated team regarding coordinating quality. Um, I'm mainly again working on the like technical side to make sure we integrate with LNAI folks in terms of what they do in the code base. But we're definitely adding people in terms of communicating all of this like feedback from from experts regarding the data set. Also, I have a quick question since we briefly touched this topic of you know social media scores, etc. Uh, do you guys use something like ResearchGate, Mendeley Desktop? and like some other tools that are like popular within your field in terms of managing papers, download discussions of them. So, I mean, I know, I know many people use these tools, but I think it, they're really dispersed. Like I think everyone has mm -hmm. their own favorite. It's not consistent. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah. I only use them to get papers sometimes. I don't, I think the, if I had to guess, I would say Twitter is the most, most widely used sort of mm -hmm. social, social media tool by scientists. Okay. Because the thing is like, I'm a, like, I'm worrying that with this altmetric thing, right? The guys essentially did what we were just discussing right now, right? I mean, they started a couple of years ago or I mean, decade ago, whatever, but they are facing the same issues that everybody is using their own set of tools in terms of how they interact with papers. They come up with some solution that is not perfect. But now since we got the score, we got like, oh, somebody already did this. We have amazing score, right? But it's the same type of score if, we, for example, we're going to build it ourselves in terms of let's you know, request Mendeley Desktop, for example, like download stats or research gate and you know build some relationship between researchers from there or something right so that's why again like i'm i'm, I'm a little worried that this altmetric is it, it's better than nothing but at the same time i'm seeing in terms of execution building that score for research is ridiculously hard so uh, just just my my yeah. two cents. I, I would start with one of the numbers you can get from that because it's really easy, universal and that it's they've already done it for every paper. And then yeah. if you want to come up with a better method later of incorporating kind of impact, then you could do that. You can always do that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Anton, for playing devil's adv advocate here and limiting our excitement about the alt metric that helps <laughs> all right 
Um, okay, well, uh, we've already generated more work than, than I can possibly comprehend. Um, what uh, Do you guys want to get back to the, um, the a, a more simple thing to accomplish, which is the types of papers task? And, <coughs> and see if we can quickly fill in the, the, this thing that Alex mentioned in, as in uh, most frequently occurring types of uh, data. So we have this for clinical trials, or, or we don't actually, right? Because this is just subcategories. Um, what are the, the things that sample, right? Uh, like, yeah. If you can so, just quickly sample, go through So things. whether or not it's randomized, I would say rather than have subcategories, you could say like whether, or not, is it randomized and controlled? What is the sample size? What phase is it? Um, and I guess, well, all the trials in this data set, had, the results are reported. It looks like, because they're not collecting from like clinicaltrials.gov. So I don't think they're collecting trials that are not completed. To any extent yet. And that's what do you mean by phase? Well, phase, no. So that's phase one, two, or three. So phase one trial is a testing for safety. Phase two is slightly larger test for safety and efficacy. And phase three is the sort of final stage of testing for efficacy before a drug is approved. Okay. Well, what about also adding the type of drug that is tested? Okay. So, for example, you can see straight off if the study was made for remdesivir or something else. Yeah. Actually, yeah, and um, I guess you can tell, you could probably tell whether it's a small molecule or an antibody just from the name, right? Or, well, maybe you'd have to look in the paper. I have no idea what you just said, but... Uh, oh, yeah. so... Yeah, there are drugs that are like a small molecule, like a chemical, and there are also drugs that are made up of proteins, like antibodies. Um, oh, more like vaccines? Or? Not necessarily. So an antibody can be, a, a, so you can take a, an antibody and you can express that antibody um, by itself in, uh, back, like you could purify a lot of that antibody. You can make it in say bacteria or something like that. It's called a monoclonal antibody and you could purify that and use it as a drug. So. Okay, so it's not even like substance, but like type of... Um, I like, guess cer certainly whether it's a vaccine or a treatment is definitely worth recording. And mm -hmm. then also like what type, what class of drug is it? If, if it's a treatment, is it, what, if it's a vaccine, what class of vaccine? If it's a treatment, what class of treatment? Um, so like there's different types of vaccines. Some of them are based off of DNA or RNA. Some of them are based off of protein. Some of them are based off of uh, like killed virus. Some of them oh. are based off of live virus. And that sort of stuff is useful for us to know. Um. Can you repeat a couple of those examples again? So I can write it down if that's helpful. Uh, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Can I just provide a counterpoint? Just because it does seem like this gets really complicated is that I feel like if you're searching for these things based on the name or I feel like you would already kind of know what you're looking for. I don't know if, like, I don't know if we need to go into that level of granularity, but I'm open to here Different yeah, opinions. it's actually easier to reduce stuff than, uh, you know, build up stuff. So it kind of helps that you guys are providing, you know, a little yeah. bit more structure. Yeah, maybe let's leave it at drug or vaccine then. Yeah, okay. I feel like that's probably good. Okay. I think in terms of like execution paths, how we will <laughs> narrow down it all to like this more, I guess, deliverable structure is right now, essentially, we have a different groups of tags, right? And now they could overlap. So it's like a huge VM diagram, right? And our goal is to find that core that is actually impactful in terms of what type of grouping of, you know, trial of phase two with like complex compound, things like this. So I think in order to start, it'll be definitely beneficial to have all of this multiple groupings. Then 
the moment when we're kind of having this pipeline of extracting that information from papers so we can label them, we could kind of see in terms of, I guess, number of these different subgroups, play with them a little bit, and then we'll kind of see, oh, wait a second. Like if, if we use this specific like combination of tags, it, it's worthless because there are only like a handful of papers there, or maybe it covers everything anyway, so it's not worth to be included in this type of list. Exactly. I guess. Go ahead. Sorry, and then I'll shut up. Um, I guess I don't. I don't think I explained too well what I meant because I don't mean. I think I was wrong at first. I was talking about subgroups, but actually now that I think about it, I think it makes more sense to just focus on all those categories as like the groupings, and then for a paper in a given grouping, you can list a bunch of information when it when it's pulled up, and now that can be built out over time. So it might be the first step would be to try to classify the paper uh, as one of uh, OYO's alternative categories. And then the second step is for each category trying to extract stuff. So you can make like a sample size extraction algorithm for trials, you know, and that can kind of be built up over time. Yeah, and actually what you're talking about is the next piece that I wanted to discuss, which is what are the columns of these, paper, uh, uh, these tables? Because um, essentially, you know, these columns are defined both by the type of the paper and the direction of research. Because essentially, if you're, you know, epidemiologist and you are still interested in like a clinical trial type of uh, papers, but from another perspective, and the columns that you might be interested in could be different columns from the the ones that virologists could be interested in or like molecular studies person right is, is that the right assumption yeah i think it's true that depending upon the kind of study the the um like sample size or you know like the different categories you're looking for is is different, uh, but it's hard to sort of <laughs> make that more concrete because uh, each paper could have different variables in it. I think what I what I might do is say, you know, for each type of paper, there are different column labels. So, like, let's say you you search for something, then first you have like you know a big heading, you know, molecular papers, and then it would say, you know, looking at our uh, sheet. It would, the columns would be like uh, model organism, study type, et cetera. And then you would have another section, clinical trials, and the columns would be sample size, type of trial, vaccine or drug. And then you have you know, another section for like epidemiological studies, and the columns are you know, all of those little bits of information that you can extract, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's like creating spreadsheets, right? Kind, kind of, of. And dynamic like ones mini spreadsheet for each uh big category of paper yeah so i guess what we're trying to do is to come up with to give you guys a bit more details about what you could include in these right yeah so another thing for the molecular studies maybe a, like some i don't know could we say some method i don't know some major method. I know there can be many methods used. Can you explain what, what do you mean by method? Um, I'm just, you know, uh, I'm just thinking about um, what kind of methodology they used to get at the question. And you mean like an actual like scientific framework or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know, what do you guys think? Or, I mean, usually we use several methods in the paper, so I don't know if that could be useful. Hong, I don't know if, like, for viro as a virologist, would you be looking for that? What kind of technique they used? Well, usually when I search some articles, well, for example, I might search some COVID-19 and then um, by reading a title of the article, I can predict, okay, this is this paper is about 
some immunology is so based on the title, I can distinguish roughly uh, is the paper is focused on some vaccine development or is it uh, about some antiviral agent or is it about uh, some analyzed immune cells activation status or things like that. And then, uh, and also for example, is this about some host response after COVID-19 virus infection. So, uh, and yeah, so I can assume based on the title and I can uh, remove, which is, so yeah. And then I can open the paper and see the method. So uh, regarding some, yeah, virologist, regarding some virus study, first of all, I need to figure out which, study they are focused. Yeah, so antiviral agent, immunology, vaccinology, virology, and host response. Those are uh, five subcategories that I can thinking of regarding some virus infection study. So, yeah, so I think those five subcategories can belong to number six. If, yeah. But is the number six really the like the 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 things within the first five categories? Well, it's kind of a type of article that you publish when you develop a new method. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I think it should be its own category. I mean, there's even journals like Nature Methods is its is its own journal. Okay. And the simulation and modeling, that's also the type of paper? I just added that based on uh, looking at the, the corona men. Mm -hmm. And that's, that probably includes a lot of like looking at population data in the past and stimulating how the disease spreads. Uh, and another thing you can do is also model how proteins interact um, based on known structures. Uh, so it can be both, you know, like epidemiological stimulations and molecular stimulations. Um, and the meta-analysis also I just added from looking at the different categories that were already present in the corona men. Mm -hmm. And that seems like, you know, um, mixing data from many different papers and looking at it all together. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you guys. How, how, are you, how does one go about developing a, a classifier for, you know, say these uh, six to eight major categories? So the, the quick, easy answer is that we are going to transform a bunch of text in kind of a vector space into, you know, just to model relationships between the words. And then we're going to find clusters of things that are most probable to be connected. And then we're going to use the human input to tweak those clusters. Does it make sense? Yes, uh, somewhat, yeah. Is there a good example that like explains this process really well for, you know, text mm, classifying? Anton, Anton do, you, do you have a good kind of visual or something? Uh, not sure. Uh, I'm just actually, trying to make sure I, that- I have a good example. We just wrote an article on Medium how we did it for geospatial data. And right, Anton? Like, would that be okay? Maybe, you know, Brandon did some publication with some clusters that he created. There was some nice visual just to demonstrate maybe that will be. I need okay, to we'll, we'll find something. Yeah. We're going to find something. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm trying to make sure is that, like, you know, these. When, when Hong says that she looks in the title or the body of a paper and is able to figure stuff out. I'm make, trying to make sure that the information that she's using is also information that your algorithm is getting access to, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And most probably it is to some extent because she's using a lot of mental constructs that she learned throughout you know, her career and professional experience that we don't have access to in the Core 19 data set. Um, and we can only extrapolate that information based on the available data. Because right. uh, like deriving the knowledge from the data is a completely separate process. Yeah, yeah, of course. 
So I found this paper and I think that's a good one though. It's kind of technical a little bit, but it showcases okay. some of these things. So I'm gonna send an email with, with this. Great. This is the one. Actually, uh, I have a quick question that is kind of like very simple and basic one. In your field, guys, do you use keywords that on, on papers or it's not really useful? I'm coming from a computer science academia, so we actually use keywords a lot because, for example, if you do machine learning, you look for supervised, non-supervised problem. And then if it's something like, let's say, unsupervised, then you look, is it like Gaussian mixture model? Is it k-means, et cetera? So is, is there usage of keywords for your field though it's not very useful in your workflow? I mean, we use keywords to search for information and you know, you include keywords in all of the articles that you publish now. So yes, definitely there's use for keywords and finding that information for each one of us, right? So the better the keywords describe that paper, the easier it is for us to find that paper that we need. I mean, I guess my question is how useful they are in your field. Because, for example, like, uh, so I was doing, my, my PhD was in bioinformatics. So when I was doing search, for example, like, oh, what algorithms do people use for specific problems? Those keywords were useful for math side of things. But, for example, all of the biology-related stuff to me was just, okay, it's just a cloud of words that is extremely hard to navigate, right? So like people were not i guess labeling correctly or you know just it was too much noise in the keyword space that, that the authors of papers put in there so in, in your field is very like similar to this or you also see that people actually properly use it so it, it helps you navigate and cut in the search space so what Can i don't you? think it'll be interesting oh. if the keyword is it if that is possible to figure out this keyword belongs to introduction part or result part or discussion part, I think that would be useful if you can distinguish that. Because for example, if I search some one keyword, <coughs> keyword if the keyword belongs to introduction part or discussion part, uh, then it means some background information uh, that was came from other literature. But if the keyword belongs to the result or method area, then it means they, uh, it might mean that they used the keyword for, they did some experiment to related with, uh, more directly related to the keyword. So it would be useful if you can distinguish the keyword in the article, if the keyword belongs to introduction part or result part or discussion part, if that is possible to distinguish that, then that, that might be useful, I think. Tulsi, you wanted to say something? I was just going to say that it's not, they're not very systematically used. So for many journals, you do have to submit keywords, but not for all. Uh, and even then it's, you know, it doesn't always necessarily describe methodologies in the way that you're describing in math. Uh, they're sometimes just descriptive, uh, you know, and might have like, if you worked in a specific part of the brain, might have that part of the brain, brain as a keyword, but not really describe what you do with it. Um, so I think it's pretty variable how useful the current keyword database is. So let, let me ask you, when, when you mean that, uh, when it's not like kind of that descriptive, you mean that uh, you don't necessarily search for like study plus visual cortex, right? You search for something more specific to the interest of the study versus the actual keyword, right? Okay, that makes sense. Anton, does it, does it help? Yeah, yeah, I mean like, uh, I definitely got some useful information from, from the answers that we could definitely utilize down the line. Because what all of that system would describe, like discussing before, in a sense, what we do, we are doing automatic keyword labeling of papers. I'm not talking about keywords in, in search terms. I'm talking about that 
what we have in, in all of the scientific articles, that, that section of keywords, right? To help people navigate a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now we're essentially expanding that, right? And again, it depends on from which field of academia coming from. If it's math, everything is more structured. So those keywords are actually everything you need to know to kind of navigate the space of articles, let's say for supervised learning. But again, my personal experience in biology related field, it was always like kind of like, okay, I need to be an expert in biology to kind of make sense of those keywords. So again, for like coronavirus related things, it's closer to biology. That's why, again, why keywords are not apparently the solution for this, right? So we need essentially this building that system that helps navigate not the keywords as, as labels by authors, but to, to extract them from the paper itself. So at least that's how I kind of see this problem in my mind, my mental model over here. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess our keywords are like very general, like mm -hmm. even just for a general topic, but then there can be a, a high variety of actually what you do in that paper. So you can get a huge return for that very general keyword. Yeah. Well, I remember like when I was publishing papers, when you submit, you do a couple, like three keywords would be essentially, okay, I want to be like my paper, my method section that I designed, I want to be in this part of the, you know, space, right? Like scientific space. But then the rest is just kind of, okay, what should I add so people would describe, like find my paper more likely right and then you add in all of the like noisy keywords uh so i mean it's even in in, in my field computer science was the same type of issue there as well okay well i i feel that we are now so much better at understanding what we actually have to do uh obviously um, there are a lot of assumptions that we understand what you you guys explain to us um and we we should probably let you guys come back to this uh sheet and let me let me actually create a, a a new tab for it and i'll keep this one as kind of draft ideation but then i'll create a new one uh create a new one that will be just this and uh what i would like you guys to to help us with is actually uh, let's uh, I guess I'll, I'll delete this one uh, this one and um, help us fill out the missing pieces for these uh, let's say um, things that most probably exist in this type of paper right it, is that a good way to describe it on a general description. So now it seems to me like the most important thing to do in the short term is to cement the types of papers because I guess your first step is going to be to try to make a classifier for paper type, right? Yep. And the reason why I want this to be filled out is because it essentially will help us understand what what things exist in those and there will be kind of a feature um to to use the the vector space to build things uh around mm -hmm. because just this gives us enough data to was quite a good certainty to find clinical trials so if if you can um after this call um, spend some time and try to fill out these and you can you can actually do multiple columns uh, just so can everyone can uh, do their their own ideas and then we can have a quick call just to to merge those into one or something like that uh, you, you know what I mean right yeah that sounds like a good idea okay and can I clarify something that Anton mentioned? He was saying that like the more words you have, the better, just because that helps you build build out these models. And so is it worth thinking about things like, you know, if it's a human study, 
it will mention an IRB, or if it's an animal study, it'll mention IACUC. These are like regulatory bodies. Like these are connections that like we know would exist. Like if you see an IRB in there, you're like, oh, this study has humans in it. So is that the kind of thing that would be helpful? Like knowing like connections that we know or? That would be great. And like, we, we don't even uh, have to understand all of these keywords. So just list them out and that will help. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, uh, that's the same sheet that I've shared before. Uh, you guys have a link to that. Um, to me, you know, these kind of look like the easiest ones to most probably even try to classify in the nearest term, the clinical trials and molecular studies. And then we can, you know, extend that to these more kind of general ones. At least to me that they, they sound a little bit harder, just based on the, the heuristic of the fact that it was much easier for you guys to provide feedback on, on these versus these. Okay. Well, uh, I feel like we just learned a lot. So need some time to digest and process that. Very, okay. very helpful. Uh, and I really, really appreciate you guys jumping in. And it like you're actually shaping up what this will become. Cool. And uh, not to apply any pressure, because I know we all are busy with many things, but I was just curious so I can get an idea what is your guys' time scale for like trying to classify these things? And can we help out in the process? You know, if you guys come up with a bunch of UMAP clusters, can we look at them and say, hmm, I think we might have an idea of what these clusters could represent? Because what, you know, it might be useful for, to you, for us to see, you know, we might be able to help see, for instance, if it's actually separating into these categories, if there's a category we forgot about, or if uh, it's separating into categories based on subject matter more than type of paper or something like that. That would be amazing. So um, if you can go on our website and fill out the form, you'll receive an email with the link to join Slack. And once you join Slack, uh, just message me and I'll add you to the channel where all of this uh, process is happening. So that's the best way to, uh, to kind of uh, tune you in into the continuous progress. Great. On the time scale, well, I, I'm really hoping we can get some demo of it this week. Anton, what, what do you think? Well, so far what we have already, right? We have all this type of terms for all the papers we have in Core 19. They're all like machine, like the machines on the server read it all, right? Chopped into engrams, different semantic indices were built, etc. Now, in a sense, what we need to do is take uh, those keywords from like Excel spreadsheet and just trying to see, like merge them together. So now it's not about machine finding out oh, there's some like the most common keyword or something, but kind of with this human guidance, just to simply see what type of clusters we will see, right? And if some pictures will be there, like, like it's good looking, then I think we will, we're really close to the result. If not, then again, it will be like a long process. To, not too long, but I mean like back and forth to kind of tweaking this and that. But so far, I think we're in a good spot to have something like next week, just to kind of see and get feedback from you guys um, in terms of are we in a good direction in terms of implementation, implementing this or we can kind of lost in the whatever we have there. Which is the data. probable. <laughs> I mean, it most likely will be somewhere in between, but yeah, we will see. But yeah. the, the, the great part is like, at least for me from this call is, uh, I was kind of like, damn it, we, we're doing so much work, which is kind of great, but we're doing this extensive type of search and discovery, what entities we need to extract, et cetera. Now here, since it's like human guidance is present, then it becomes much smaller space to explore. So everything should be much quicker than before. So I'm super happy yeah. with, with this part. 
Uh, one, one last question, by the way. Have you guys looked into whether anyone has previously developed a classifier for type of scientific paper? So I actually read the paper uh, yesterday on, on this topic and I'm not sure, like it's, it's, the, it's very applicable, but it was helpful for, uh, for me. So this paper is purely for uh, randomized controlled uh, trials and there, there is some useful stuff there, but I got lost in the actual like details of it. So I, I can share this paper. Maybe you'll be able to help digest it in, in a better way, just because I'm, I'm so far from understanding what is the randomized clinical trial at all. So, yeah. And another question about timing. So when would you prefer us to submit our, you know, the subcategory description words? I mean, um, if you can do it today, that would be amazing. If not, whenever you can. Okay, so ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so I just sent um, uh, the, the article for this existing ML attempt to identify RCT. And we should be good, unless there is any other thing that we forgot to discuss. Um, anyone has any feedback? All right. Thanks so much. All right, thanks guys. Yeah. This is fun okay. and I, I really enjoyed the the, the the thought process of this multidisciplinary collaboration. It's definitely <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thanks guys, bye. Thank bye. you, bye. bye.